to this conversation. Well, Fui, I think, as you know, my intention is as soon as uh, COVID is passed, I want to be back and I want to be there in person. But you know that for me, Ghana is a very special place, that one of my mentors, as a very young international lawyer in the late 1980s, was a wonderful Ghanaian, Thomas Mensah, who was, I believe, the dean uh, of the law school. He was someone I turned to at a very early stage in my career for advice on work that I was doing on the environment and the marine environment. He was extraordinarily generous with his time. You knew him very well. You've known him even longer than I knew him. Sadly, he's no longer with us. Uh, but he was so acutely intelligent and so wise, and he became my mentor. Uh, and he lived very close to me in London. We would see each other very often. We even supported the same football team. I'm very pleased to say, incidentally, that Arsenal have a new member, a Ghanaian, Thomas Partey, has just joined, which Tom Mensah would have been absolutely thrilled about. Uh, but he's not with us, and so I dedicate this, my part of this session to the memory of Tom and to his wonderful family, which is my family. And I'm so pleased to be with you and, and, and for him to be with us in this way. Yeah, Philippe, I remember you wrote a great tribute to, to him when he died. And none of us can forget the words, the mischievous twinkle in his eyes <laughs> actually reflected who he was. So, yeah. I mean, and, you know, so it's, it's, it's special for us to, to be here with you. Yeah. Well, as you, you, you remember him as a very independent spirit. I even had one case for Ghana, which you'll remember at the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea, which concerned an Argentine vessel that was um, apprehended, shall we say, and uh, was then the subject of international proceedings. And, of course, Tom found against us. He found against his own country. And to me, that is a mark of the man, the absolute fearless independence and integrity the best international lawyer I've ever known, the first president of the Tribunal for the Law of the Sea, a simply fantastic human being with a mischievous twinkle in his eye, always. Indeed, indeed. Indeed, joining us for this conversation is either a panel. I will begin with Aloysius Denkabi, who is in the English department at the University of Ghana. Hello. Hi, hi hello. Hi. And I will go next to Nikki Bensiencho, who is a freelance editor, former student of the University of Ghana as well. Hello. Greetings, all. Next, Kina. Kina, shall I say, Kina is a bibliophile extraordinaire and uh, a reviewer of books and an editor of manuscripts. Hi, Philippe. Nice to have you here. Wonderful to be with you, Kina. Martin lectures in physics in the, at the University of Ghana. He's a writer and co-director of the Writers Project of Ghana. Hello. It's a pleasure to be joining in this conversation, and uh, I am very sure it will be a very enjoyable one. And uh, finally, is our organizer in chief, Oliver Mauser Baka Vomawa, who's a PhD student in Cambridge at the moment in international law. To, to join the conversation as well, I, I look forward to an exciting discussion with Philippe. Philippe, from what I've read about your interviews, you have said that. The Rat Line is the second in the trilogy, of which East West Street is the first. All of us on this panel in the last couple of months have engaged ourselves in discussions after we've read the books. And the, we've all been sort of so impressed as to be almost overwhelmed. And there's so much that we can say in, in the period that, that, that we have. But I thought that it might be a good idea for us, for you to set us out by just telling us what you aimed to do you know, in, in, in the project, and in particular in the rat life. 
Sure. Thank you so much, Fui. Well, I mean, you you know me well, Fui. We've we've worked together on cases, and you know that I'm basically a lawyer. I'm a professor. I teach international law at London University, and I'm a barrister. And I have written a few other books on bits and pieces and academic books. But in 2010, so exactly 10 years ago, exactly now 10 years ago, I received an invitation to give a lecture at a university in Ukraine in a city called Lviv, L-V-I-V. And I was asked to come and give a lecture on the work that I do about crimes against humanity and genocide. I'd been involved in a number of cases, Rwanda, Yugoslavia, Argentina, Chile, other parts of the world where terrible things had happened. And would I come and give a lecture? I accepted to give the lecture, not because I had a burning desire to give yet another academic lecture, but because my grandfather came from that city. Uh, it's a city with many different names. When he was born there in 1904, it was called Lemberg, and it was in the Austro-Hungarian Empire. It then became Lwów in Poland, and then after the war began and was occupied first by the Soviets and then the Germans, it became Lvov and Lemberg again. And then after the war, Lviv. And I knew my grandfather well. He lived in Paris, but uh, he only passed away, you know, in the mid-1990s, so we were very, very close. Uh, but I had never talked with him about what happened before the war. He had always declined to talk about that. My brother and I growing up knew that that was something that one didn't talk about. I knew... He'd lost a lot of family. He was Jewish, but he really didn't want to talk about it. And so we never asked him about his mother and his sisters and all the family members. So I thought, OK, I'll go and give this lecture in Lviv and I'll see if I can find the house where he was born. And that was really how this adventure began. I found the house, but I also discovered something extraordinary. It's an accident in a sense. I don't really take any credit for it because I wasn't looking for it. But I discovered that the man who invented the concept of crimes against humanity, possibly the greatest international law of the 20th century, Hirsch Lauterpacht, came from Lviv and had studied at that law faculty. And the people at the law faculty who didn't realize that the inventor of crimes against humanity came from their own law school. So that was pretty amazing. And then I discovered that the man who invented the concept of genocide, another Polish lawyer, Raphael Lemkin, also studied at the same law school, and the folks who invited me had no idea. So I turned up in October 2010 with this sort of astonishing news that the origins of genocide and crimes against humanity, invented in 1945, started in that very law school in that city. So they were thrilled, and a whole relationship began. And I decided to write a book about the three men, my grandfather, Leon Lauterpacht, and Lemkin. And then a fourth man came into the story. And his name was Hans Frank. He was also a lawyer. Uh, he had studied at the great law schools in Germany. And he was Adolf Hitler's lawyer from 1928 to 1933, and eventually became Governor General of Nazi occupied Poland from 1939 onwards. And in that capacity, he oversaw the killings of Lauterpacht's entire family, oh. Lemkin's entire family and my grandfather's entire family. He was then apprehended in May 45 and put on trial in probably the most famous trial in human history, the Nuremberg trial, the famous one with Goering and everyone else. He was defendant number seven. And you literally couldn't invent it if it was a novel, but Lauterpacht is selected to work as a prosecutor for the British team. Lemkin works with the American team and they prosecute Hans Frank. But when the trial opens on the 20th of November, 1945, exactly 75 years ago, they do not realize that the man they are prosecuting is the man who's killed their own family members. So as someone who litigates in court, that touches me. And as someone who reads a lot of novels and a lot of literature, that also affected me because it opened my imagination. What was it like for those men, those three men in the Nuremberg courtroom? So that was the story really of East West Street. And it was a very personal story because in the writing of it, I discovered that Lauterpacht, Hirsch Lauterpacht, who was the father of my first teacher of international law, Eli Lauterpacht, was actually born in a small town called Zulkiev on a street called Lembergerstrasse, East West Street. And that was the same street on which my great grandmother was born. So there was an absolute direct sort of connection in this family way. In a way, I learned about myself in writing this book. So the first book was East West Street, and it told that story. 
In writing the story, I came to know the son of Hans Frank, and it may sound very odd, but we've become really good friends. And the first time that I met him in 2011, and I met him because he'd written a book about his own father. He called the book The Father, Der Vater. Uh, and you, you, you met him, I think, um, Fui, when we were in Washington together, as I recall. Yes, yes. I, we went out to dinner with Nicholas yes, yeah. after your talk on East yeah. West Street. Yeah. So, uh, so it was pretty amazing to be with a man whose father was hanged for the murder of four million human beings. And he despises his father. The first time I met him, he said, um, you know what, Philippe, I, uh, I'm against the death penalty in all cases, but not in the case of my father. He deserved to be hanged for what he did. We came to know each other. He shared a lot of stories with me, which um, in East West Street. And then one day he said to me, you know, you're interested in the city of Lemberg, Lviv. Would you like to meet the son of the governor of Lemberg, Lviv? Otto Wächter, my father's deputy. And I said, sure, I don't know why he'd want to meet me, but why not? And a few weeks later, Nicholas and I went off to meet Horst Wächter, the son of Otto and Charlotte Wächter in his very dilapidated, I mean, it sounds very grand when you talk about a castle, but it's totally unheated. He lives in total poverty in two rooms with no heating, nothing. I mean, it's really a pretty desperate situation. And I liked Horst. The difference between Horst and Nick was that Horst's father had been indicted for mass murder, crimes against humanity and genocide. But when the war ended in May 45 in Europe, he escaped. And so he was never caught. And he died in strange circumstances, which we'll come on to perhaps, in the Vatican, uh, protected by a very well-known Austrian bishop in the summer of 1949. And unlike Nicholas Frank, who despises his father, Horst Wächter said to me, it's my duty as a son to find the good in my father. Even if he was a Nazi, even if he was involved in terrible things, he was not a criminal. I have the right to find the good in him. And so Horst becomes a major character in the rap line. Yes, indeed, uh, Philippe. One of the things which we found fascinating about the work, particularly the rat line, is the way in which you actually portray characters. I mean, people who in other circumstances might just be caricatured for either the evil that they've done or th that they defend you make humor. And I think we have a number of questions for you on this, these portrayals of some of the characters in uh, both Rathline and East West Street, and, and, and not just the, uh, those who committed atrocities or were complicit but also even some victims and other, other actors. So I think we'll, we'll, start, we'll start with, uh, you know, this phenomenal woman who Kina will ask you about. Yeah. Hi, Philippe. Hi, Kina. Uh, so um, I fundamentally believe, I mean, your own hard work and brilliance notwithstanding, that we are actually having this conversation. We are in this moment because of Charlotte, the wife of Otto Vesta. Um, I, I, was, I was so impressed by her, her strength of character. Um, she seems to be the only one very openly um, believing in the Nazi party, even in her own unreliable archive, um, her own yielding support for her husband, um, and enabling his rise um, in, in the party structure, in the governance structure. Hey, the use of her extensive networking, her, the use of her social skills to drive and support Otto's career. And Charlotte all was always rising up to every single occasion. Um, so first of all, my first question to you is, before we get to her archive, is what, can you speak a little bit about your own impressions of this, of this character, of this woman? Thank you, Kina. And it's a really great question because for me, Charlotte Wächter, born in 1908, is the beating heart of this book. She is the remarkable character. There's various men in it. And as we've discussed earlier, and as Fui knows, I mention Fui in particular because I've come to understand uh, that Ghana is a matrilineal society in which women play a huge role. I will never forget the day when I was... Uh, 
introduced to members of the legal team, to wonderful former Attorney General Marietta Brew came to Istanbul to talk about a possible boundary delimitation with Cote d'Ivoire and work, working on that. And it was unlike any other team I'd come across before because all the leaders of the teams, of the team, were women. The top lawyers in Ghana were all women. And, 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 and in Europe, we're not used to that. And in the rest of the world, we're not used to that. And, and your question resonates with that sense that I have of Ghana's interest in these remarkable individuals. So Charlotte was a student of art. She had a very good eye. Many of the photos in the albums, which we'll come on to talk about later, are her own photos. And she had a fantastic eye. She designed fabrics. You've got behind you a most beautiful fabric. I've noticed, and I'm wondering how Charlotte would react to that fabric. And she used to take trips around Europe, selling her fabric designs to very serious producers. And then one day she meets uh, Otto Wächter, who's a young lawyer uh, in Vienna, already a member of the Nazi party, but a commercial lawyer. Uh, and she falls in love with him, her baron, she calls him, and she describes uh, what he is like. She's a headstrong lady. She um, is so headstrong that when she's 18, her parents don't know how to deal with her. So they decide, <laughs> um, this will resonate, I'm sure, with some people in the audience, to send her to an English boarding school where they think some, you know, backbone will be beaten into her and uh, she'll be put on the more virtuous path. Um, she falls in love with England, actually, and, and, and she decides uh, she has a lifelong love for Britain. She joins a boarding school in Eastbourne. She becomes the favourite pupil of the, her headmistress, who happens to be the sister of the writer Arthur Conan Doyle, you know, the inventor of Sherlock Holmes. Um, she's not an intellectual, but she loves cultural matters. She loves music. She loves drawing. She loves painting. She is an incredible sportswoman, a champion skier, a champion mountain climber who climbs to, you know, one mountain three and a half thousand meters high with no ropes, no nothing, just, just boots in her hands. Um, and she loves her man. And she is going to look after her man. And it is pretty clear, as I tell in the story, that at crucial moments in his life where he has decisions to take, for example, in 1938, the Germans have just occupied Austria. Hitler has come to Vienna. They stand with Hitler in a huge crowd on the streets. And after that, they have a conversation. And Otto says to Charlotte, so, my darling, what should I do next? I have a choice. I could become a lawyer carry on a distinguished career, or I could accept a job in government uh, and enter the public service. And she's the one who says, enter public service. And she stands by him throughout all the joys and horrors that follow. And when it comes to an end, she is the one who saves his life. So you could see this as a remarkable love story. So I'm at the same time astonished by her and repulsed. You know, mm -hmm. it's this sort of love-hate relationship. She's plainly yes. a remarkable human being. Yes, yes, thank you. Um, so, Charlotte's archive, which is which forms the basis, um, the foundation for the rat line, um, includes authentic accounts of the watcher's life, but it also in assembling the archive, it's obvious that she omits um, Otto's treatment of uh, the Jews and his role in the crimes he was indicted for. Um, and she herself offers very little commentary about how she feels about, um, about, about the Jewish population, even though there's an incident when the Americans come into town and she's the only, she's the only one in Vienna admitting to being an Austrian. Um, I love unreliable narrators, so she's completely unreliable. Um, can you talk a little bit about how, why, what, what you think Charlotte's motivation in keeping the archive is, and how you dealt with the unreliable nature of her archive when it comes to the um, um, Otto's, um, um, Otto's dealings and Otto's, you know, horrors. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, Kina. I mean, Charlotte is the heart of the book. And if there's a secondary heart, it's it's her archive. So just to explain to people who are, who are watching what happened, I come to know 
the horse back to the sun. And we make a film together, which you can see, actually, it's on YouTube, I think, free to view. It's called My Nazi Legacy, What Our Fathers Did. Horst, who has a good sense of humor, also says the subtitle is wrong. It should be What Our Fathers Did and Did Not Do. Um, but at a certain point in filming, Nicholas Frank describes Horst as a new Nazi, which he's not. I don't think uh, Horst is racist or anti-Semitic or Nazi or any of those things. But he has a certain love of his parents, which could be interpreted in a particular way. Horst takes offense to what Nicholas says and says to me, how can I prove that I'm not a Nazi? And, which is an interesting question. I say to him, well, you know, you've got this incredible family archive. Your mother kept every letter she wrote to your father, every letter he wrote to her, their diaries, the photographs, the documents. Why don't you just give the material to a museum, and then scholars and researchers can look at the material. He's a terrific idea. He gave it to the museum in, in Washington. Actually, Fui, I think we all were there together in the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. And it became publicly available, um, although not online, so you've got to go there and go into the, into the archives. And at that point, Horst said to me, would you like a copy for me? And I said, well, okay, why not? And two weeks later, uh, single USB stick with 10,000 pages arrived on, and it's astonishing. From 1929 to 1949, every letter, every diary, and you can trace their lives. And it's not just from 1929 to 1945 when he is in power, so to speak, but also when he disappears. So we've got this incredible trove of material of a Nazi on the run, hoping to get to South America via the rat line all of their letters, all encoded at that period because they're worried that people are reading their letters and they'll give away the identity of the people who are helping them. And we can talk about that more in due course. But then after her husband dies in mysterious circumstances, and we'll come back to that also in 1949, she spends the rest of her life, 36 years, trying to go back and speak to her husband's old comrades and colleagues and leave a record of how great her husband was. So, for example, she goes off and finds this real Nazi journalist called Melita Wiedemann and interviews her in the Four Seasons Hotel in Munich in the cafe. And unbelievably, she records the conversation. And in the trove that Horst gave me are the recordings. So you can hear these two elderly Nazi ladies, you know, raising a glass, toasting to Adolf Hitler, talking about the good old days and talking about what they got up to, the culture, the opera, but in 10,000 pages with all the diaries, the letters, the recordings, the photographs, almost not a word about the acts of killing, not just of the Jews, but of the Poles, but whoever has filleted the archive, and she is an unreliable witness, absolutely, because she has a narrative. She's got an agenda. She didn't, or her son did not completely and properly fill it to the archive. And I went through it with three graduate students at the university. Every single page we read, we translated, and you'd find nuggets of horror. So for example, September, November 1939, he's in Krakow. He writes a letter home. My darling, it's wonderful. The Vienna Philharmonic has been, the ministers have been, everyone is celebrating my great work. A little bit of local trouble. The governor general has been attacked. And tomorrow I have to have 50 poles shot. So she, he's writing home and telling her the horrors he's getting up to. Later in 42, he's complaining because all the Jews have been deported. There's no help at home. There's no one to put powder on the tennis courts. And you get these little hints which are important for a number of reasons. Firstly, you get a sense of what's been cut out. And secondly, you understand that she knew everything. And in 10,000 pages, there is not a hint of regret about anything that happened. Indeed, quite the contrary. You recall here the moment when she, after the war is over, she goes back to her parents' house in Vienna and it's being occupied by a, an association of victims of Nazi concentration camps. And instead of expressing any regret for what has happened, she basically throws them out of the house and says it's a disgrace that you're occupying this space 
it belongs to me, you will get out now. But it's all done without any regret, any <laughs> hesitation, and you get a real feel for this character. Thank you. My questions are done. Yeah, well, well Kina, I thought you were going to talk about just in particular her support for her husband when he was on the run up in oh, the mountains. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, I don't, um, Philippe, um, I'm, I'm glad, I, I wasn't aware she was a, an expert mountain climber because that explains how she joins him yep. on those rendezvous on those mountains. Um, but what was also so impressive was that she matched him every single step of the way. And when he was he was ill in the, in you know in that circum those suspicious circumstances, there is the incident in a part where it's obvious everybody wanted to get to Rome, and she's like toughen up. <laughs> um, um, so, in in my sense, I think. I mean, we all don't want, I mean, I don't want Nazis, male or, or, or female, but um, it's obvious that she was the stronger character. Yes. She, um, um, I mean, she was the backbone of Otto. And I don't even believe, I don't even take much stock into how upset and jealous she was with his philandering. Because she, when he was on the run, she also understood that he was charming. He had to charm women to get his way. Can you speak about, can, yeah, can you speak a bit about their relationship? A lot of inappropriate relationships on the side, shall we say, in, yes. in Otto's <laughs> life. He was an extremely good looking man. He loved women. He had many relationships and she would react in the following way. This gives you a sense of her. And you've understood that I saw my role as a writer. I never comment on the moralities because I feel that my role is to lay out the material and let the reader form their own view about these characters. It's not for me to impose on the reader my interpretations. But to give an example, in 1934, Otto is the leader of a plot, a coup attempt to kill the Austrian Chancellor, Engelbert Dolfus, and he, he is killed. And Otto flees, and he flees to Berlin where he joins the SS, and he works with Himmler and Heydrich and Eichmann in Berlin. Charlotte joins him two years later, and in 36, and she discovers, they're already married by now, and they've got two children, and she discovers that he's having an affair with a young German lady called Tauter. How does she get her back on him? She, when she becomes pregnant a year later, and delivers a child, who is a little girl, she decides to name the child Tauter after his wife's mistress and writes to him and says, that will teach you a lesson. And, and what you can understand from that and everything that follows is there is a power dynamic in this couple. And what I'm fascinated about is they have a relationship in the last 20 years. For the first 15 years, in a sense, Otto appears to be in control, although she is the one who's holding the family together. That's absolutely clear. But the moment the war comes to an end, his power seeps away. He goes off and hides in the mountains for three and a half years and then makes his way to Rome. And there is a total shift of power. She is now in control. He is totally dependent on her simply to survive. Every two or three weeks, she goes to a rendezvous in the mountains. She brings him shoes. She brings him clothes. She brings him food. She brings him newspapers. He's utterly dependent on her for survival. And to cut to the chase, the point that you mentioned, there is that dramatic moment in 49. He's fallen desperately ill. He's desperate for her to come down. I mean, the letters are painful to read. I have to pause myself because this is a monstrous Nazi who has done absolutely terrible things, including the murder of my grandfather's entire family. And yet I'm reading these painful letters that he's in extremis in a Vatican hospital desperate for his wife to come and she obviously doesn't realize he's dying and she writes back and says yeah but you remember that time in 1937 when i was really ill you didn't come to me straight away you made me wait you and you get a sense of the strength of this character i mean 
she plainly was quite a character in many ways. And I think it, coming back to something you said earlier, Tina, we learn in life that nothing is simple. Nothing is binary. People are not good or evil. People do monstrous things and they do good things. And people who do terrible things are also capable of great love and great humanity and vulnerability and weakness. And I think to portray people like Wächter and Hans Frank purely as monsters misses the point because they also had aspects of their character of human decency and generosity of spirit. And the real thing that I'm trying to understand in writing these books is how is it that decent, intelligent, highly educated, cultured people cross lines and get involved in mass murder? How does that happen? That's the beating heart of what I'm interested in. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Kina. These sort of great questions, I'm sure. Yeah, I'm sure everybody likes. Wonderful questions. Philippe, I think we want to switch to your grandfather. And uh, Alou has some questions for you. Oh, great, great. Yes, uh, Philippe. Uh, another towering figure. Uh, in, but, but that's in East West Street, not Rat Line, your grandfather. What is remarkable about your grandfather is his choice of silence. And what is also remarkable is your reticence uh, in depicting the character. But notwithstanding his silence and your respectful reticence, the character comes out, you know, uh, uh, truly central to East West uh, Street, the narrative. His, his personal story opens up, is a springboard actually, for the larger narrative about crimes against humanity and genocide. And he, he strikes the reader as a proud, dignified, heroic individual who bears his, his shall we say, burden, his experience, you know, with dignity, you know. So I, I was completely taken, Philip, by your grandfather, and I don't know whether you'd like f to share further thoughts on on uh, on his portraiture. Hello, you, you, your words touched me so deeply. I don't think I've ever heard anyone put it more beautifully than the way you've put it. I feel incredibly touched by your words. You know how it is when we're growing up, when we're children, we all remember that. We, we, we have our parents, but then there's these characters, if we're fortunate enough, and I was, to have our grandparents around, and we don't really know very much about them. We love them in a different way. I've noticed it with my children, my children's relationship with my parents. This is, it's a very special relationship, the relationship between grandparent and grandchild. And I knew him very well. He lived in Paris. I lived in London. We would see each other two or three times a year. He'd come with his, with his wife, my grandmother, who I loved. But it was a different relationship. It was plain that my grandfather was the main one. They were very humble people. He didn't go to university. He, he, was, a, he was a watch repairer. That was the job that he had. And I remember they lived in a tiny apartment in a relatively, you know, sort of impecunious part of Paris. And they had, they, they, he worked in his own bathroom. He, he, separated out the bathroom behind a curtain and he worked behind the curtain. My brother and I were always completely fascinated by that area behind the curtain where there was just a little table and lots of watches. So he was, an ob he was a person of fascination for us. <laughs> but of course, he never talked about what had happened. He never, he never talked about that. And as my brother and I got older, we knew things had happened. He had lost his mother and all, his entire family. And he never would talk about it because I think he felt a sense, I've come to realize, a protective embrace of the future generations to not, if you like, hurt them with these very painful stories, but also something else, I think, the shame of survival. 
You know, I talked a lot. We at the beginning we talked with Tom Mensa. Um, Tom Mensa reminded me a lot of my grandfather. I have to say, I think one mm. of the reasons I had this incredibly warm feeling towards Tom was he had that same restraint of that generation that did not shout about their accomplishments or or what they had done from the rooftops. They 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 had a dignity. You you used that word. And what I really wanted to know in writing East West Street was who my grandfather was. He was a deeply religious man. He was not religious as a younger man. It was in his later life that he became a man of real faith. Um, it was a very big part of his life. And he would sometimes say that it was, it was a way of finding a connection with the past because it was something that had been lost with, with people who had passed away or been murdered. That was a point of connection. But let me connect what I'm saying about my grandfather to the main theme of East West Street, which is these two legal concepts, which I had grown up with. You know, they existed when I went to law school. I'd heard about them, genocide and crimes against humanity. Genocide was invented by Lemkin to describe the protection of groups. Crimes against humanity was invented by Lauterpacht to describe the protection of individuals. And in writing the book, I came to understand much better than I had before this tension which I think all of us have, all of us on this conversation have, of human identity. Who are we? How do we describe ourselves? How do we define ourselves? How do we want the law to protect us? Do we define ourselves principally as individual human beings, or are we members of a group or many groups defined by our nationality, our ethnicity, our color, our religion, the football club we support, whatever it is, any number of different group identities each one of us has. And the book, and the writing of the book, made me realize that one of the group identities we have is family and our sense of relationship with family. And that was always there for me. But writing East West Street, I was able to articulate it. And as you know, there is a moment right at the end of the book when I find myself at a mass grave, a place where 3,500 bodies rest to this day. And they include the bodies of the family of Hirsch Lauterpacht, the brother of Hirsch Lauterpacht, the, the uncle of Hirsch Lauterpacht and his family, and also my grandfather's family. And in that moment, where my intellectual instincts have always been in favor of Lauterpacht's idea, put the individual above the group, at that moment, in the presence of a mass grave of my grandfather's family, it is impossible for me to resist that instinct of, of kinship and connection with my grandfather, with his community, I can't resist it. It overwhelms my intellectual sense, and I have a deep and powerful emotion. But as you say, probably because I'm a barrister who appears in court, throughout the book, there is an utmost restraint in sharing that emotion. I don't wear my passions on my sleeve. I don't wear the emotion on my sleeve. And that is a mark I think that I picked up from my grandfather, but I'm immensely touched by your words. You know, I'm, I'm going to send this recording to my mother because it will literally make, <laughs> will make a week with happiness. Yeah. Father. Thank you. But last question, uh, if, if I may, moderator, there is a telling moment in uh, East West Street when uh, Leon gets news late in his life about the death of Malke. Yeah. His mother. And his mother, yes. And uh, he takes the book that has the list of names who died uh, with her. And he enters his room and he's head weeping, yeah. you know. That is the respectful restraint, which I think you've just alluded to. And I was, I mean, it, it completed for me the portraiture of the, of the man, his dignity, his strength. And, you know, I, you know, I, I think it's, it's a beautiful moment. You know. Thank you for saying that. I mean, Malka, you know, was born in the 1870s in, in this small town of Zulkiev on the same street as Hersch Lauterbach. 
Lembergerstraße, East West Street. So there's a, this direct connection, curiously, between my great grandmother and the and the and the law professor who was my first teacher and my mentor at university. So that touches me very much. And she lived her life, and she had a number of children, some of whom died early, and some of whom lived, and some of whom died in dreadful circumstances, murdered. But I think also she always retained a dignity. And right at the end of her life, in 1942, she is deported from Vienna to a place called Theresienstadt, and then Treblinka, where she is murdered in a gas chamber, the same gas chamber in which Raphael Lemkin's parents will be murdered a month later. And there is a moment when I was doing the research on that, and amazingly, you know, the Germans kept incredible records, unbelievable records. So you can find the hour she was at the train station, and you can find the train that she was put on, and then how long she spent in the first place, and then when she was transported to the second place. And what that does is that opens up the imagination. And I, I can imagine her standing on a rail platform in Vienna. She's allowed one bag, 25 kilos, going to she doesn't know where, but she can imagine. She's a smart lady. She knows what's coming. And that is the time when I give lectures on this that I come closest to weeping in public because there's something about an elderly lady held in those circumstances. And I have to say that image and the connection with the story you give is one that motivates me in my own work. You know, right now, one of the cases that I'm doing is the case for Mauritius, an African country, against the United Kingdom in relation to Britain's last colony in Africa, a place called the Chagos Archipelago. The British call it the British Indian Ocean Territory. But it's a colony, basically, is what it is. And it was detached unlawfully. And I've worked very closely with the community of 2,000 Chagossians who were evicted from Chagos between 68 and 73 in absolutely deplorable circumstances and sent to the four corners of the earth and they want to go back and we're going to get them to go back. That is a personal mission that I have. But amongst the Chagossians, there is one lady that I've come to know, Lisby Elise, an extraordinary lady in her late 60s, who was our star witness at the International Court of Justice. And I know that one of the reasons that I feel so attached to her story because she told me once, when she was thrown out by the British in 73, she was allowed one suitcase, 20 pounds. And that was it. And that touches me. I understand, I can't know the pain she went through, but it resonates with me because it's the same experience. And I think that there is in this way an interplay between the personal relationship with my grandfather and the connection of his story and the kinds of cases that I do now, and the kinds of connections with people like Tom Mensah. Tom and I talked a lot about colonialism. Tom and I talked a lot about his childhood in the Gold Coast, as it was called. And he, you know, Fui, you know what I'm talking about. He maintained that same dignity. He didn't, he had strong views, and I know he had strong feelings, but he didn't wear them on his sleeve, and they motivated him and they pushed him along. And you know, we then find ourselves late in his career, the Tom Mensah, child of colonial Britain, becomes appointed president of the International Arbitral Tribunal, resolving a dispute between Ireland and the United Kingdom. It's amazing. <laughs> For me, that's an amazing thing. And it's all seamlessly connected to our own personal histories. But, uh, hello, I've so appreciated your, your comments and questions. Thank you. That will be my last question. But <laughs> Well, I don't know about that, hello. We might invite you again. But, you know, Philippe, um, I, I, you said something really interesting about the, the struggle that you have, you know, choosing between or re reacting to the crime of genocide. I think Nike would like to ask you about that. This is the hierarchy of, of, of norms. But I, I, Nikki, forgive me for trying to paraphrase you. You are right here. So just go ahead. No problem at all. I, I was just struck by what you yourself wrote as um, ambivalence uh, of, of being in a limbo as regards crimes against humanity 
and uh, genocide. And then th that moment you describe about being, you know, in, in, in front of the lake with, with the thousands of, of dead bodies in it, it's, it's a wonderful passage. Um, you said for a brief moment you understood about, you know, being an individual in the wrong group. So you put them together in a certain way, uh, you know, a, a very interesting way. But you had written by then that there had evolved a hierarchy, you know, with a genocide seen as, as the crime of all crimes. So, I mean, the simple question was, uh, where, where have you got to in thinking about the subject, you know, the relationship? Thank you, Nikkei. It's a really complex question, and it's a complex question around the world that posits the relationship between the individual and the group. And I'd never really thought about all of this um, when I had been doing cases in the early 2000s on genocide in Yugoslavia and in Rwanda. But I had become aware that when terrible things happen, when large numbers of human beings are killed, Prosecutors had told me that victims wanted the crime to which they had been subjected to be characterized as genocide. In other words, war crimes and crimes against humanity wasn't enough. And I'd noticed also that if, you know, a president of the United States, say, referred to what was going on in X or Y place as crimes against humanity, war crimes, no one paid much attention. But if the president referred to it as genocide, all of a sudden everyone perks up. And of course, that still goes on. We know right now, for example, the treatment of the Uyghur community in China is being characterized by some as a genocide. And in part, we know that it's being characterized as genocide because that garners attention. So I have a number of reflections on this. One is I just ask myself the simple question, why is the killing of large numbers of individuals less terrible than the killing of large numbers of human beings because they're a member of a group. Let me give you a practical example. In Britain, on the 27th of January each year, there is something called Holocaust Memorial Day, which commemorates or marks the murder of the Jews of Europe by the Nazis and by others. But very wisely and very correctly, in my view, they also commemorate other acts of mass killing. And so I asked the question once, I'm on the advisory council, which chooses which you know, horrors to mark, how do you choose which events and which acts of horror to commemorate? And I was told there was a formula based on the British Foreign Office ideas. Firstly, it has to be after 1945, because that's extremely convenient because it means you don't have to deal with Armenia, you don't have to deal with British colonial rule, we can put slavery on one side, we can, you know, all of that just goes on one side. And secondly, an international court must have characterised the acts of killing or mistreatment as genocide. Okay, I get it, I said. Let me see if I've got it correctly. So you will mark the killing of 8,000 Bosnian Muslim men in Srebrenica in 1993-1994, that you will commemorate, but you will pass in silence on the killing of three million human beings in the Democratic Republic of Congo in around the same period, because it's only a crime against humanity or a war crime. Correct. So I ask myself the question, what is the social utility of that? What is the system of law that we have which says that we reify and put on a pedestal certain human beings because what's happened to them is called a genocide, but vast numbers more who've been mistreated and very often killed in very large numbers, we pass in silence because it's only a crime against humanity or a war crime. And, and that's part of the difficulty that I have. Beyond that is the problem that genocide, unlike crimes against humanity, you have to prove an intention to destroy a group in whole or in part. Crimes against humanity, basically, if you're a prosecutor, you've got to prove large numbers of killings. That's it. That's a crime against humanity. Kill 5,000 people, that's going to be a crime against humanity. For it to be a genocide, you've got to, be, you've got to prove a mental intent. 
that you intended to kill those people as part of a project to destroy that group in whole or in part. Firstly, that's a very difficult thing to prove. But secondly, in seeking to prove it, you, um, I, I think, reinforce the sense of intergroup hatred. The perpetrators hate the victims more, the victims hate the perpetrators more, and I felt that in dealing with cases. But before I end, let me argue against myself, because that's what lawyers need to do to test our own arguments. So I've become skeptical about genocide. And then, if, like three or four years ago, I was contacted by a remarkable psychologist, medical doctor and psychologist in Germany, who is Turkish and Yazidi and Kurdish, who organized a program to bring 1,100 young women who had been um, raped and abducted and raped and terribly abused by ISIS in northern Iraq and Syria to bring them to Germany for post-trauma treatment to help them on a psychological recovery. And I met a lot of these extraordinary young women. It's one of those brutal sets of meetings I've ever had. And Jan Kiselhan, for that is his name, said to me, you know, Philippe, I came to you because I needed someone who could prosecute this as a genocide case. And I said, why genocide, Jan? And he said, because crimes against humanity isn't enough. War crimes isn't enough. Why not, I said. Because, he said, the magic of Lemkin's word is that he invented a crime which recognizes the right of the group to exist as a group. And in the process of recovery, the fact that young Yazidi women can know that they have a right to exist not only as individual human beings, but as Yazidis, is incredibly important as part of the healing process in a psychological sense. In other words, your, the legitimation of your group identity is an important end in itself. And so the simple answer, Nikkei, is I just oscillate constantly. I can see the pros, I can see the cons, but, but I, and genocide is with us forever, and crimes against humanity is with us forever, and the two exist in this, in this tension that, that physicists and scientists will understand. Um, you know, Niels Bohr, I know, had you know, notions about waves and collisions of particles and these levels of complexity, you will understand far better than I do. But it's not a simple answer. I can't give you a simple answer. All I can do is tease out the issues. Well, if, if, if I can just jump on the last, last thing you said to, to, ask a, to, to ask a different question uh, and, and see if you can give a simple answer. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, for all the restraint you showed in, in these two books, you know, doing the research and talking to the people and so on, there's one clear time when you said you lost your temper. Um, with Horst, and, and I wanted to know what you said. Well, it was 2014. It was the summer. And I was with Nicholas, the son of Hans Frank, and Horst, the son of Otto Wechter. And we were in Lviv. We were going to visit the killing fields. And we were making a BBC film, which some of you may have seen, My Nazi Legacy. And Horst had for four years been telling me there is no proof about my father's complicity in any of the crimes. And so he was an innocent man as far as I'm concerned. And so I spent a long time looking for evidence. And I eventually came across, it took four years to find it, a document in an obscure Polish archive, which was the indictment of Otto Wechter for mass murder, for crimes against humanity and genocide, for murdering more than 100,000 people. Actually, it's half a million people. And it detailed the crimes he had committed as governor of Krakow, rounding people up, putting them in camps, labeling them, sending them off to their death, and the same thing in Lemberg, District Felicity. And so finally, I find a document, okay, black and white, set the words are there, all set out, witness statements, the lot. Horst looks at it, this is being filmed by my dear friend David Evans, who made Downton Abbey, in case any of you are partial to English television, and Horst looks at this document and he says, yeah, yeah. Well, it's obvious. He says, of course. I said, what do you mean, of course? He says, this is a Soviet document. 
This is a document which was intended to attack people like my father because they were anti-communist, they were anti-Soviet, and because they were Christians. And I just lost my rag with him, you know, I really did. It was not my finest moment in court. Fui knows we try to maintain a restraint and a decorum, you never attack anyone. You... And I just lost my rag and it was on film. And, and my, it was my friend who was making the film and he said, can I use that? And I said, look, David, it's your film. You're the filmmaker. We've agreed. It's your call. You do whatever you want. And when it came out, my beloved mother-in-law just took offense to that in a gentle way, took offense to that scene and describes it to this day as the elder abuse moment. The moment where a younger man in his 50s attacks this poor old lovely man forced, you know, in this horrible way. Actually, I mean, you've, some of you would have seen the film. It's pretty restrained. I'm really not very mean to him at all, but I do, <laughs> I do get irritated. And it goes to the, you know, 30 years of training as a member of the bar. Don't lose your rag. You maintain your cool. You respect people. You speak courteously. You don't shout. You, and it was being in that place my emotions got the better of me and I regretted it but it happened and it was recorded and actually I don't mind too much because it showed that I was human that I was a grandchild that I was you know that I had emotion I wasn't this cold awful lawyer who can't express emotion but it's it's interesting that you focus on it it gets quite a bit of attention that moment thank you Nikkei for raising your question thank you thank you sure now, say, I'm sure you want to pick up a couple of points on what Philippe has said, whether in terms of the uh, genocide crimes against humanity or the issues of identity. Thank you, uh, Fui, for this. Uh, I think I would, I, would, I would love to get a bit into the conversation about identity, and then perhaps we can have another conversation around the genocide and and crimes against humanity. But something that was on my mind and has continued to stay on my mind when I was reading both the Rat Line and West, East West Street was Jean Paul Sartre's famous uh, quotation, L'Enfer c'est les autres. In fact, you have acknowledged that one of the, the strongest themes that emerges from the East West Street and the Rat Line are constant issues of identity. You know, identity, how we manage it, what we do with it, uh, or don't do with it, how we weaponize it or pacify it. And we see this, right, at different instances. We see flashes of peaceful or perhaps even harmonious coexistence of different identities in Lviv. But we also see the othering of identity uh, at various instances as well, especially as the right expands. And for many people in, in Africa, the question of identity has never really left us, you know, whether it's through the juggling of multi think. Uh, religious and linguistic identities in the framework of artificial boundaries, uh, whether we are reckoning with the legacies of the European colonial project and how it's cultivated and even instrumentalized uh, different native identity cleavages, but also on the need on how to negotiate how these different identities coexist. But as, as I try to resolve the associated with identity, we create a new one. Now, I want to know what, what kind of insights uh, your research, while you're undertaking the research, what ins insights uh, or the story, what stories you discover or even formulate that give you some, some sense of how we go about resolving and managing these questions of identity in a way that is affirming and doesn't lead to sort of the cyclic or negative consequences we, we tend to see. That is such a big issue, Oliver. I mean, you, you're living in Cambridge, I think, right now, so you're seeing the convulsions that Britain is going through. For example, on Black Lives Matter, the statue story in Bristol and the desire of the community to bring down a statue in relation to a slave owner and the debate that has ensued and how you do or do not mark or honour or recognise you know, founders of colleges at Oxford and Cambridge and other places. And these are really complex issues. And I realized that in writing East West Street, taking these two crimes, genocide and crimes against humanity, I'd stumbled into this bigger issue of identity. And and I, I don't have simple answers to your question. I do have many insights. 
I mean, taking back Allo's point about my relationship with my grandfather lived through the years of his childhood and everything, I spent a lot of time thinking about what the town was like when he grew up there in, in Lviv, Lemberg, you know, in the early 1900s. Very multi-ethnic, all religions, you know, all over the place. There are Muslims and Jews and Catholics and Russian Orthodox and, you know, Greek Orthodox and living in a complex tension, living in a complex tension. And then the terrible 20th century, you know, wreaks its havoc and a lot of people are killed. You know, a lot of different people are killed or chased out. And what that makes me think about is my own city, London, you know, which is a city I love and which is a city that I love in very large part because of its multi this and multi that. It's what I celebrate about London. You know, it is a place of many different communities who've come together. And there's a backlash going against that now. Brexit is a backlash against that. It's a way to try to stop that. It's a way to try to, you know, if you like, purify, quite unquote, get back to the glory days of the 30s. That's what I think is going on. That's what I also think is going on in the United States, we have a big election next week. And we've seen that at the heart of this election is a subject that a lot of people don't want to talk about. It's the place of white supremacy. That is really what is being articulated in the States right now. And what insights I've got is I've become super sensitized to these issues. I've been able now to empathize in ways that I hope I could empathize with previously, but to understand issues in very different ways and that has immense practical consequences so this is part of the writers festival let me throw out an issue which i'm having real trouble with i'm really reflecting on what's the right thing to do i had mentioned earlier this case i've been doing for 10 years for mauritius and working with the chagossian community and this extraordinary person that i've come to know lisby elise um who we've become very close friends i mean when we got the judgment which basically ordered the British to leave Chagos. We just sat there in court. We were so anxious, we were holding hands for an hour and a half as the president of the International Court of Justice. And the vice president said to me, I saw you holding hands with that nice lady over there. We were just so anxious about it. It was just a human instinct, you know. So I'm writing a series of lectures about that for the Hague Academy, which will, was supposed to be given next year in 2021, now will be in 2022. And it's the double story of Madame Elise, born in 1953, and decolonization from the 1950s through Resolution 1514, through everything that happened, right up to the decision in the Chagos Advisory Opinion, through the terrible Southwest Africa case, which you know very well, where the International Court of Justice, in its most shameful day in history, ruled that Liberia and Ethiopia had no legal interest in the treatment by South Africa of the inhabitants of what is now Namibia. I mean, just the most terrible day for the International Court of Justice. And I think to understand the Chagos advisory opinion, you've got to go back to that 1966 moment. And, and the court has now redeemed itself finally. It took 50 years, but it has really redeemed itself. So I'm writing lectures and I'm writing a book. And of course, it raises the question, what is my right as a privileged white man living in London to tell in any way the story of Lisby Elise? who is black, who is Chagossian, who has been terribly mistreated by the British, okay? And, and I'm really anxious about it because it's her story. It's not my story. I'm just the bit part lawyer who happened to come across her. And she and I have discussed this at length. She wants me to tell the story because her view is if I tell the story, it will reach more people. My American publisher says, you can't tell the story. You're a white person got to be her story she's got to tell the story she says well i write a book and tell the story no one in america knows me no one in britain knows me no one's going to buy the book i want my story to be known that matters more to me if you faithfully take my words so that's a story of identity that's an issue of identity which i'm really struggling with and from my friends who i consult with i get differing views about what is the right thing to do and somehow over the next two years i will work out what is the right thing to do? But I throw it back in a different way, and I would say to you, Oliver, are you precluded, for example, to take Allah's focus on my grandfather? Are you, because you are a black man from Ghana, not allowed to write about my grandfather's story? 
Absolutely, you're allowed to write about my grandfather's stories. Absolutely. I have no problem with you writing a law review article or a fiction or a non-fiction. Why can't you enter the world of the imagination and imagine being... Are you not entitled to write about Lviv in 1923? Of course you're entitled to write about Lviv in 1923. You can write about the legal issues of Lviv. You can write a non-fiction book. As far as I'm concerned, you can write a fiction book. Because none of us have ownership, even over our own stories. We have an interest in our own stories. And we're open to criticism if we take the stories of others and write about them in a way that that community doesn't like. And I'm entitled to say, if you write in a way that I don't like, huh, I don't agree with how you wrote it, but I respect your right to have done what you did. So something has gone wrong, I think. Something has gone wrong, and it comes back to the genocide issue. It has come back to this reification of group identity. And I think the main insight that we have is that we need more empathy, and we need more respect, and we need more understanding, and immersing myself in East West Street and the Rat Line, including spending a lot of time with neo-Nazis and the children of major Nazi mass murderers, has made me a more empathetic and, I hope, kind and understanding person. Um, but I'm really confused about this issue of identity, including how I wish to be identified. Um, curiously, I mentioned this to Fui, I'm very happy to be able to say that I, I'm now able in strict formal terms to refer to myself as an African, because in order to do my hearing last week at the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea, in order to get into Germany and to avoid a 14-day quarantine due to coronavirus, the wonderful government of Mauritius furnished me with a diplomatic passport for Mauritius for which I had to obtain the nationality of Mauritius, which I took with honor and as a privilege. So am I an African today? I don't know. I mean, you know, this is really, I'm throwing that out there as a rhetorical question, but could I never be an African? Perhaps the answer is no, uh, but, and I'd respect that completely. But in a sense, it's a construct, isn't it? It's a construct. All of this is a construct, how we define ourselves. But it's a brilliant question you've asked, and, and I, I, I agonize over it. Yeah, no, I mean, you've thrown up such interesting, uh, you know, sort of points and observations. I mean, matters on which we could actually engage in discussion, you know, on and on. I and I was almost tempted to ask writers on this panel to sort of respond to some of the challenges that, that you talk about or writing the Chagosian lady's story. But I'm going to resist that temptation because I want us to get back to talking about the rat line in particular. We, in, in the last half an hour, so I think we've talked more about uh, East West Street. So. I, I'd like us to get back to sure. some elements of, uh, you know, the, 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 the rat line. I think one of the fascinating aspects of the rat line is the way in which the sort of fracturing of World War II alliances change attitudes to Nazi Germany. And just the extent to which those who were allies in World War II began to compete to recruit Nazis. Yeah. And I mean, you, you, you sort of, I, one of the things that I, I, I'm really curious about, I'm amused about is the way in which you got enlightened by your friend John Le Carre. But I'm sure you'll tell us uh, either sort of about that. I mean, uh, but yeah, I think Alou, Alou has some questions about yeah. Thomas, the lucid story. So, but, you know, I think that it illustrates in a can very... I, can I just, shall I just, I, I do want, I love Alou's question, so of course I want to think, but shall I just give one minute on the John Le Carre so people understand? Yeah. Because I think it contextualizes the Thomas Lucid story. And so yeah. what I stumble into in, in the archive that, Horst has given me is the fact that Otto Wächter, who's gone on the run, ends up in Rome in 1949, arrives there in April, is parked in a monastery, 
is looked after by these unnamed characters, the religious gentleman, Comrade X, you know, all sorts of characters. And it takes us three years to uncover who everyone is, and we basically work out that he's stumbled into a Cold War espionage story. So I don't know anything about the Cold War. Well, I mean, I know what I read in books and movies and that kind of stuff. But I'm very fortunate in many respects. And one of those respects is my next door neighbor is a writer who writes about the Cold War, John le Carre. Read, if you want to read a great book, read A Perfect Spy, basically the biography of his father. So I call him up and I say, can I, can I come and talk to you about the Cold War, Italy, Austria, 1949? He says, sure, send me some documents about the Vest. Just come and have some cakes, some tea, and we'll talk about it. I go, we sit down, he says to me, amazing stuff. I said, why? He said, I was there in 1949. He said, what do you mean you were there in 1949? He says, I was 18 years old. I was in the British Army. My job was to interrogate Germans, people who we thought were bad Nazis. And I said, what, to, to prosecute them for crimes? He said, no, to recruit them. I said, what do you mean to recruit them? He said, there was a new enemy. The new enemy was the Soviets. And all of a sudden, the Nazis were our friends because they knew who the communists were and they knew where to find them and they knew where we could root them out from the holes in the ground and the other places. He said it was very confusing. He said, I had to turn on a sixpence. You'll understand the expression, Fui, and Allo will too. Not that many people will anymore. But it, he said it was very confusing. I spent my whole life, I was 18 years old, being told the Nazis were the worst of the worst and now they are our friends. The short answer is, Welcome to the wonderful world of Britain and the United States. Welcome to the world of duplicity and the world of double standards and the world of ever-changing alliances and welcome to the world of espionage. It was a real uh, mind blower, I have to say. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think you can pick up on oh, from, from there. <laughs> I think you have to unmute them. Yes, yes, yes. So um, the the lucid family story, uh, I think it's Philippe who can tell it best. <laughs> you know, my skills do not match the telling. It's a fantastic, a remarkable little story at the heart of the book. And it, Philippe, it gathers together the themes that are hinted at in the subtitle of uh, the rat line, you know, lies, betrayal, love, justice, family bonds, and so on and so forth. But what is also uh, gripping about that story is what you ended up on, uh, the, the, the shifting international alliances and allegiances all caught up in that story and the the connecting points i think i think that is your phrase in the book the connecting points uh, uh lucid has hakta uh tom jr victor and horse those are the connecting points which which bring out this wealth of human issues as well as the the international the realignment of the international uh, uh, space you know I, I i i wonder if you'd like to share some more thoughts on that uh, well, on that how, with us how long have you got hello <laughs> <laughs> I could go on for this for hours because it's literally unbelievable. Let me just cut to the chase. We've mentioned John le Carre. He's a soldier there. Basically, he's operating under the Americans and an entity called the Counterintelligence Corps, which is part of the United States Army, who are supposed to be Nazi hunters, but instead they have become Nazi recruiters. And... That's part of the story Le Carre gets involved in. The head of the CIC outfit that's hunting and recruiting in Rome, he has a great name, literally you couldn't invent it, he's called Thomas Lucid. And he's basically an American spy. 
who goes on to be a spy in Vietnam, actually, a very famous American spy in Vietnam. And his job is to basically recruit Nazis. So he, this, you, you know, I could never have invented this. He sets up a spy network, a group of eight agents, nine agents, a chief agent and eight sub-agents to basically hunt for communists in Italy. His chief source is a Nazi mass murderer called Karl Haas, okay, who will, 40 years later, be convicted of crimes against humanity by an Italian court and be sentenced to a lifetime imprisonment for the largest mass murder that has ever taken place on Italian soil in Rome, in the Argentine caves. Lucid hires Haas. Haas then hires eight sub-agents. You couldn't invent this. Three of them are members of the Italian Fascist Party, including the Secretary General of the Italian Fascist Party, who's being held in an American prison and is also a spy for the Americans, being paid $50 a month. Three senior Nazis, and perhaps even more remarkably, two senior Vatican officials, including the bishop who has been helping Otto Wächter get to Argentina. Alois Hudal is an American spy, paid $50 a month. And his other Vatican <laughs> colleague, again, this surprised me, Pope Pius XII's chief press spokesperson is an American spy, paid 50 bucks a month by the Americans. So these people are all in on the Otto Wächter story. And it turns out the day he arrives in Rome, thinking he is going to be hunted by the Americans, they know exactly where he is. They're keeping tabs on him. And they're going to probably try to recruit him. So that's the big picture. Within that framework, let's just say that Thomas Lucid had a liaison despite being a happily married man with his wife back in America, with his Italian secretary, and produced a child, a daughter, called Enrica. An illi uh, 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 sorry, um, Lucid produced a child, a boy, um, uh, called, called Victor. Uh, and Victor is his illegitimate child, born out of wedlock in Italy, through an affair he's had with his secretary. Unbelievably, Victor later marries the daughter of his chief spy, Karl Haas. The viewers, listeners won't be able to work this out. It's so complex in the mind. But to cut to the chase, I wanted to meet some of Lucid's children, his legitimate children, born in wedlock. So I fly to Albuquerque, New Mexico, armed with the information that the six lucid children, three sons and three daughters, unbeknownst to them, have a half-sibling in Europe that they, I assume, know nothing about. And the moral issue that arises when I find myself in the company of the delightful Tom Lucid Jr. and his lovely brother Barney is what right do I have to share with these lovely people the fact that their beloved father has left behind an additional sibling in Europe. And I won't spoil it for the readers. I think the simple point, Allo, is, as we all know in life, long ago acts leave a legacy which can suddenly come out of the woodwork. I suspect <laughs> that each one of you on this panel that we are on know exactly what I'm talking about in the sense that Every family has its stories that remain in the shadows and that somehow unexpectedly emerge in a later time. And that is human life and human existence. And it will continue forever. But it produces extraordinarily acute stories of human interest. And I think that's what's made both East West Street and the Ratline read a bigger audience, because at the heart of it are real ordinary folk who get involved in the real ordinary things that human beings get involved in, some marvellous and some not so marvellous. Thanks, Philippe. I, you, you know, I, I'd like us to 
get to the audience shortly. But before we do that, uh, I, in a sense, I, I, I'm going to ask one more question or make an observation around East West Street. That is the memorable Miss Elsie Tito. I mean, well, you tell us about Miss Elsie El Tindley, but again, it comes to the point about characterization and portraiture. I was really quite, you know, I suppose, amused to, by the way in which an old missionary belonging to a society described her to you, pretty with a mellow, sweet voice. Now, if he hadn't said that, the image that comes about Miss Tilney is of a stiff, strict, fervent mission. Yeah. And, but, you know, I mean, it, it was really quite fascinating the way in which you probed into that and clearly her importance for your story. So I'm I, sure the whole thing really, like, I exist because of Miss Tilney. It's as simple as that. So the mystery in East West Street was how my mother got from Vienna in July 1938 to Paris by herself, aged one. Okay, how does a one-year-old child escape the Nazis and end up saved by a series of Catholic families in Paris? So my mother said she didn't know. She had no idea. She gave me my grandfather's papers, and in the papers I find, I put a picture of it, a tiny little slip of paper. It just said, Miss E.M. Tilney, Manuka, Bluebell Road, Norwich, Angleterre. And I say to my mum, who's this person? My mum says she doesn't know. I mean, I probe my mother a bit more, and eventually she says, well, maybe it's the person who carried me from Vienna to Paris. And, and you never wanted to know. You never stayed in touch with them, no. So along begins a very lengthy um, investigation. It takes three years to discover, by process of elimination, with every person called Elsie Tilney in the United Kingdom, I had to go find the one who it was. And we eventually found it in some missionary records in Botswana and Witwatersrand University in South Africa, the African part of the story, I suppose. And it turned out that Miss Tilney was a member of a congregation in Norwich, England, the Surrey Chapel, which still exists today. And the blessed archivist, Rosamond Codling, with whom I've become very good friends, is the person who helped me uncover this story. She was born in 1893. In the 1920s, she becomes a missionary in North Africa. In the 1930s, she develops a sideline rescuing political refugees and Jews and others subject to persecution from Nazi atrocities in Germany. She will go to Austria, she'll go to Germany, and she'll bring children back and bring them to safety. And she is motivated by a sermon given by her pastor, which he sends her, based on chapter 10 verse 1 of Paul's letter to the Romans to the Jew first and I exist because of her interpretation of that line which caused her to go of her own volition to Vienna in July 1939 and bring a one-year-old little girl to safety who would otherwise surely have perished I say that because she was due to bring two little girls she was due to bring my mother's 12-year-old cousin. But at the last minute, my mother's 12-year-old cousin's mother said, no, I can't bear to be separated from my daughter. And three years later, she perished in a concentration camp. And that would have been my mother's fate, and I wouldn't have been here. So I owe a debt of gratitude to Elsie Tilney. And having uncovered that story, I could not stop. I became so fascinated by this lady that I followed up what happened next, and I tell it in the story. And she ends up interned and spending four years in a, in, a, in a camp in France where she performs further heroic acts. And the most remarkable thing about Elsie Tilney, I think, 
fact is that for the rest of her life, she passed away in 1974, she never told a single person about what she had done to save the lives of, I suspect, dozens of human beings. Because in that generation, you didn't do that. You, you, you did your work and you did your things and you remained silent and discreet about it. It's that discretion, Allo, that I, you mentioned in relation to my grandfather, that I mentioned in relation to Tom Mensa. It's that we know that generation has this extraordinary quality of humanity and discretion and restraint. And, um, and so I brought the story out. And I was in two minds about bringing the story out, to be honest, because I think she wouldn't like it. I think she would feel very uncomfortable to read the chapter I've written about her. But I felt I had to. I felt I owed her a debt. And, and her family was delighted. And her family have since been honoured um, because of that. And she has been honoured around the world. Final story on that, um, the city of Norwich, where she was born and lived, wanted to put up a statue in her honour. And her congregation at the Surrey Chapel refused. They said, no, we're against idolatry. We'll just take a certificate. A piece of paper will do, thank you very much. We don't want no statues. And I thought that was very moving and very, uh, still to this day, discretion, restraint. We don't sing from the rooftops. We do our work quietly and we get on with it and we don't want any praise and we don't want any recompense. And we just do our decent things. A remarkable human being. And, you know, it just taught me, coming back to lessons learned, never judge a book by its cover. I probably would have met her in the street some tough old battle axe I imagine she would have come across as one of the most humane and extraordinary human beings I have ever come across and I owe my existence to her and I can never forget that. I, I think we'll just have one one last observation picking up on, on Miss Tilney by, by Martin and then we'll open it up to the to the audience. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you very much. And uh, I also found the story of uh, Miss Tony extraordinary. Um, I just was taken aback that someone could actually save other people's lives and keep quiet about it for the rest of their life. I mean, it's something which I really, really had to sit down quietly and try to come to terms with. But um, having said that, I also was struck by the idea of religion. And how much of a, of a role a religious beast must have played in the action. actions that she took. And then I also started to think about the role that religion must have played in all the, the other characters that we've met. met. And, and I, I, I'm, I'm just, just wondering, um, in, 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 in your investigations and in your um, assessment of the, the, the conditions and the situation at that I, time, the religion ever spare people on to do more or less, less evil. And uh, uh, there's this um, line that I, I, I find, find from the, 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 the line. A newspaper um, article, I believe it was, uh, um, based on this speech that the Islam must have did it, 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 I think, and uh, it's by fighting against, against the Jews and um, the them not to work. And so, so this again brings to the, the idea of religion. I'm and just asking, what is, do you think religion had in the I lives know. of these people and in the larger tragedies, tragedies that they did issue? Yeah. That's a, a really wonderful question that I've also thought a lot about, Martin, because one of the things that I've... That, I mean, it, it, it's, it's, it's an expression of the last... Kind of, you never judge a book by the cover. Don't, don't ever characterize a human being because of the label they carry, that they are yellow, white, black, British, Ghanaian, American, Congolese, I mean, whatever it is, life is just not like, this is the, it comes back to this point that ultimately we have to look at the qualities of the individual human being. And one of the things that I've learned in this is that you can't, you just can't, you know, brush or tar just an entire community because they happen to be a member of a of a, of a particular group, including a religious group. We know in that period that there were some who used their own religious identity to justify their own actions. 
I've been asked many times, where did the anti-Semitism come from that motivated people like Otto and Charlotta? You know, these were highly intelligent, well-off people. They didn't lack for anything. Where did the hatred come from? Where, where did it come from? And it's a very complex question. I think in some respects, in relation to Otto, it came from his father's nationalism, his nationalistic German identity, um, and, and a hatred of the other. In the case of Charlotte, I think, I regret, it came from her Christian teachings, I think is the evidence that it came from the bishop, who was a very close member of the family, but who was also, it seems, Pavlikovsky, pretty anti-Semitic and that there were teachings which somehow informed her views in some way. So it does seem that, yes, we know that there are those connections. But, but these things go on. You know, last night my wife and I watched an incredible BBC series. I don't know if it's been shown in, in Ghana. It's called Once Upon a Time in Iraq. And it's a five-part series about the war and the consequences of the war from 2003 right up to ISIS but told from the perspective of Iraqis. And in episode five, when, Syria, when ISIS arrives in parts of northern Iraq, the most terrible things happen around Mosul, and in particular, a, um, a, a military camp with thousands of young cadets is caught by, um, by ISIS. And because the people in that camp are mostly Shia Muslims, every single one of them will die. I mean, you're talking about thousands of people who are, who are massacred in the most terrible way, simply because they are Shia Muslims by Sunni Muslims. And as some of them fled and escaped, a member of the Sunni community, a lady who lived across a river, saw them trying to flee across a river. And she hid 58 of them in her home. It reminded me of Miss Tilden, you know, doing that, saving a couple of guys who she hid in her cupboard in her room in, in Vital. I think there are people who will set aside the religious or ethnic or racial or other hatreds and will just say, no, this is a human being and this human being cannot be mistreated simply because they have this label on. We know Look, look at what's happening now in France. I mean, it's convulsing France, the beheading of a teacher for showing you know, cartoons of the, of the Prophet Muhammad. I mean, you know, and, and then today, further killings in France that have happened as, as a result of that. We know that religious belief causes terrible acts to be done, but we also know that religious belief causes remarkably positive acts to be done. And, you know, you have Miss Tilney in one breath and Otto Wächter in another breath. N nothing is binary. Nothing is other only good or only bad, I think, is what we learn. And for my part, it's, it's, it's a real desire to always keep an open mind, whether it's Nicholas Frank or Horst Wächter. Um, you know, just before the book came out, one of Otto and Charlotte Wächter's grandchildren got in touch with me a deeply religious man of the Catholic faith who runs House Wartenberg in Salzburg today, which Charlotte Wächter ran after the war. And he wrote me an email and he said, Dear Philippe, I gather your book is coming out in Austria. I would ask if you possibly could to publicly forgive my grandfather before your book comes out. That would make our life much easier. Okay, so, okay, I, you know, I keep an open mind. I get an email like that. I'm I'm not going to just swat it away. I, I, I'll engage, I'll communicate, and I write back and I say, look, this is complex, this is difficult. I'm not sure I can immediately do that, but here's a suggestion. In writing the right line, I've been assisted greatly by a couple of bishops and cardinals in the Vatican. I've come to know them well. They've been wonderful. I would like to suggest that we go and visit them together in Rome and that we have a conversation about all these issues and try to find a path to reconciliation. I have no doubt we will find a path. Um, I've done that with many other people. I think we can do that too. And he never replied. Um, and I'm still waiting. It, it may be that he does reply. The point that I make is that I see organized religion 
as providing a path to reconciliation under certain conditions, provided there's an openness of spirit. But I also recognize that terrible things are done in the name of religions. All religions have their extreme disputes. We know that. Um, and, and we have lessons from that. Nothing is either a force only for good or a force only for bad. Life is just, just much more complex than that, is, is, my, is my sense. Thank you very much, Philippe. I, I think at this point it would be good to give uh, the audience uh, a chance to, you know, sort of ask you some questions, make comments. Right. Uh, on, on the chat, I think there are at least 10 questions or comments. Kina, I think you've had a chance to, to look at what it is. Given the time that we have, perhaps you could just give mm -hmm. us a selection. I okay. do hope your mum is on the call and that we'll be able to well, get I'm gonna send. I'm going to send her the recording. I'm going to send her the recording. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. But, but you know, Kina, let, let's take the audience questions as, as you select them. Okay. Um, so there's one here. Um, this is a question. You, meaning Philippe, you said, paraphrasing, how do such highly educated, well-cultured people cross lines and commit atrocities, end quote. My question is, is there an assumption there about the nature of education, so-called high culture in the arts, that essentializes them as inuring to moral goodness? Yes. Is this an idealist view of education and culture? As a teacher of the law yourself, is there a sense in which we can affect culture such that it makes morally and legally good people? In other words, can sound education help mitigate the potential for othering that leads to oppression? I'm just looking at the question, too, by Agana Nisiri Agana, for which yes. I'm really... What a great question. Let me just be very clear. I What I definitely wasn't trying to suggest was that you put people who've been to universities in one category and people who haven't been to universities in another category. I'm very resistant to that idea. I suppose the struggle that I had in the base of, on the basis of Otto Wächter was the following. Otto Wächter enters the University of Vienna Law School in October 1919. He does so on the very same day as Hirsch Lauterpacht. I mean, you literally couldn't invent it. And 25 years later, he will oversee the killing of the entire family of his former classmate. Not only that, but in 1938, Otto Wächter is appointed state secretary and given the task of removing Jews and other undesirables from public office. And over the next nine months, he will remove 16 and a half thousand people from their jobs. Amongst those 16 and a half thousand people are two of his own teachers at the University of Vienna, including the dean of his law school. You know, and the question that I had was, how does someone do that? I mean, you know, I'm a teacher at the university. How could I imagine one of my students in 25 years time not only removing me from my teaching position, but going beyond that and um, sending me to the place of my death, you know. And the question that I posed is, I suppose it is based on an assumption that if you've been through that kind of educational experience, if you read literature, if you go to concerts, if you listen to music, any sort of music, if you are exposed to the humanities as organized through institutions of higher education, how is it possible that you can cross these lines? And I think we've touched on the issue. I think it's always because in some way, however intelligent you are, or however formally educated you might be, or however formally cultured you might be, even those people have a tendency on occasion, in some cases, to categorize human beings, them and us, and to say that is the other, they are not human, we can treat them 
in that way as we wish. And there is indeed in the archive of Charlotte of Echter a letter sent by uh, Otto to his father explaining why we need these racial purity laws to protect us against the Jews and the sort of bacteria that they will inject into our societies. You know, we know that there are those people around still today. Okay, we know, just, I don't want to get party political about it, but we have a president of the United States who is prone to this kind of thinking. And how we address that, whether it's by education or by other means, I do not know. But it is a continuing issue that is implicit in the human condition. And I think the great question all of us have, and we can reasonable people disagree about how we address it, is how we address it. How do we address the propensity of human beings to do these kinds of terrible things to each other? Kina, do you want to raise the next question? I, I, I believe one of our, somewhere, somewhere, Lesu is, Oliver, yeah, is he? Uh, that's, that's the one I'm picking. Okay. Um, so that question is, one of the themes that runs through your work is the complicity of lawyers in perpetrating harm and evil across the world. Of course, there is Hans Frank, a lawyer. There is a main character, Otto Vashta, also a lawyer. This list is not made any better by your love of Breaking Bad with this rogue lawyer so good. Then in your book, Torture Team, you touch on the role of lawyers in perpetuating evil as well. You take things a notch higher when you essentially flip the script in the Melbourne International Journal and basically put lawyers and judges on trial. My question is, what is your case against lawyers? Thank you, Samuel. Um... I love Saul Goodman, and I won't hear a word against him. He is the famous lawyer in Breaking Bad, possibly the worst lawyer ever to emerge in human literature, but a pretty amazing character who I think has, in the end, a fundamental decency. Let me come to... This is a really interesting question also. Why do I write so much on the lawyers? If you focus on my writings, not just East West Street and the Ratline, but go back to earlier books, Lawless World, which was about the war in Iraq, and how it was that the British Attorney General, Peter Goldsmith, gave legal advice allowing Britain to join in the, um, what I thought was illegal war in Iraq. And then in Torture Team, I wrote about the Bush administration lawyers who authorized waterboarding and other techniques of interrogation. And I suppose my focus on the lawyers is this. What is the social function of the lawyer? The lawyer doesn't only have a role in relation to her or his client or her or his own bank account. Lawyers, I think of in some way as guardians, guardians of the idea of a rule of law, of principle, of a system of justice. And each of us as lawyers knows that we have reached on occasion a crossroads where a client might say to you, cross this line, make this argument, write this document. No system of rules can make us do the right thing. It comes from within. It's sometimes referred to as that sort of moral compass of knowing that there is a line you do not cross. You must not cross. You shall not cross. And that's my interest in lawyers. And it's my interest in judges also. And that sense of independence, of integrity, of fearless commitment to principle. And in all of the books that I've written, there is at the heart a lawyer who crosses a line. And I suppose I'm just interested in why lawyers cross those lines. You know, a friend of mine in Argentina told me that during the dark years when Argentina had a military dictatorship and people were being killed on a large scale, the rules in Argentina required every government regulation always to be signed off by the lawyers who had proved it. And during that period, the regulations appeared without the names of the lawyers. But the lawyers were involved. You know? And I think this wonderful question by Samuel goes to me to a central theme. And it's what I'm interested in in literature, fiction and nonfiction. The social function of the lawyer. The limits of human independence. 
and how we do or do not do the right thing. And, and that's the theme that interests me. And I suppose I write so much about lawyers because I know about lawyers, because I see in some of the work that I do, whether it's sitting as an arbitrator or acting as a barrister, I see terrible things happening in which lawyers do terrible things, in which there are instances of corruption or the risk of corruption and other things. And if we can have a decent functioning legal community and decent functioning independent judges, that is at least the beginnings to a decent society, I believe. Um, the next question is also from a lawyer, <laughs> Pre Baka, and she is, this is her question. Hi, Philippe. I'm currently reading East West Street and can't wait to get into the rat line. Over the last few years, there have been a number of great books, All the Light You Cannot See, The Narrow Road to the uh, Deep North, Half of the Yellow Sun, that speak to war, mainly the Second World War, and the reverberations through the world order and our lives thereafter. I am interested in the effects on our lives of monstrous events that happen before we are born, unseen by us, but affecting the fabric of our existence. To some extent, West Africans still live with the effects of the trade in our brothers and sisters in which we were complicit. To what extent do you think our failure to examine and live in this knowledge is intrinsic in the socio-economic and political reality of our today? You've seen the question, yeah, Philip. I'm looking at it now, and I went to get a copy of the book because I think the best way that I can answer that book, I mean, I'm really appreciating these questions. Yeah. You know, I have a belief that there are ways in which human beings transmit experiences across the generations. I was very interested in how it was that I ended up writing this book and that I had my relationship with my grandfather. And I wondered whether it was possible that in the way my father gra grandfather communicated to me, although he didn't speak about things, he nevertheless transmitted things. And so I went outside the law into psychoanalysis and approached some psychoanalysts to ask for writings about the relationship between grandparent and grandchild. I knew about a little bit about the relationship between parent and child, and I've alluded to this already, the special relationship between grandparent and grandchild. And I was directed to the work of two extraordinary Hungarian psychoanalysts, um, Nicholas Abraham and Maria Torok. And I opened the book with a quotation from them written in 1975. What haunts are not the dead, but the gaps left within us by the secrets of others. And the psychoanalytical theory, and I'm simplifying it here, of Torok and Abraham is that there is a mechanism which we do not understand by which grandparents transmit to their grandchildren certain experiences and informations, including traumas. And they are passed on. And Abraham and Torek have these most incredible case studies. You know, they, 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 of how a grandchild is affected in some way by an experience lived in particular a trauma by a grandparent. And I've become very persuaded of this because I've seen so many examples of it and I've read many of these case studies. And so I think just coming back to this question, I mean, just putting it in terms where we're in Ghana, we're talking in Ghana, I, I, I would put it in these terms that experiences that you, Preba, and others, or the experiences of your forebears, your grandparents, your grandmothers, for example, in the colonial period, or going back even further, I believe are transmitted through subsequent generations and are picked up and, in, uh, and inform behavior and propensity and other things. I don't think we fully understand how it happens. There is, in parallel to the psychoanalytical work going on right now, a 
study, studies in the field known as epigenetics, which is the scientific work related to whether when a human being experiences a deeply traumatic experience, does their DNA change? And there is now some evidence. It's contested, but there is some evidence that your DNA changes when you go through a trauma and you then transmit it on to future generations, which means that in the case of my family, what happened to my grandfather's generation and his family would be transmitted to me. It means that experience of colonialism would be transmitted. It means that the experience of slavery would be transmitted in some form through succeeding generations and vice versa in other places. But I think we don't fully understand it. And I'm very careful in not saying yes, it's this or no, it's not that. But I think there's something there. Putting it another way, how could it be that in 1984, when I was 23 years old, Elie Lauterpacht wrote me a letter I was living in America, I was a visiting scholar at Harvard Law School, and I receive a letter from Elie Lauterpacht out of the blue. I'd been one of his many pupils, we hardly knew each other, and he writes saying to me, I'm setting up a new research center for international law at Cambridge University, would you like to apply for a, a research fellowship there? Okay, and I applied and I got the position and I worked with him for the next 33 years. 30 plus years later, I share with Ellie the fact that his father and my great-grandmother lived on the same street in a small town in Zhulkiev near Lviv. How do you explain that? So my wife says it's a total coincidence. I say no. I think there are ways we communicate and ways we share information. I don't know how it works, but I think we pass things on and we communicate things and we don't understand the interplay between the human mind and the human body and how generations are informed by things that happen. But my instinct is that there is, there is something there. Thanks, Philippe. I, I, we don't have a, a lot of time left. Uh, Kina, thanks. Uh, unfortunately, I think we'll, we, we, we need to be wrapping up. So, so uh, you know, apologies to all those whose questions have not uh, been answered. But what I wanted us to do Philippe, before we end, is as a, I think it was Alo who first formulated it. Where does the rat line go? Mm. What? Well, um, you know, Otto Vechter was a bit part player in East West Street and the main player in the rat line. There is a bit part player in the rat line. You remember when he arrives in Rome, he meets the religious gentleman, turns out to be the Austrian bishop, and the religious gentleman parks him in a monastery, the Vigna Pia monastery, provides him food, sustenance, lodging, and he occupies a monk's cell that has recently been vacated by an old comrade. That's how he puts it in his letters back to Charlotte. That old comrade is called Walter Rauf, Walter Rauf. And Walter Rauf fled, he was also an SS officer, he fled Italy and he makes his way to Syria and eventually he makes his way to South America, first to Ecuador and then to Chile. Walter Rauf's claim to fame amongst other things is that in the 1940s he's the inventor of the mobile gas chamber, the man who um, sort of creates the little lorries in which they would gas 20 or 30 Jews or other people, but it proved to be a very inefficient way of disposing of your opponents, and they went on to a more industrial scale later on. But Walter Half invented that mechanism. In 1973, when Augusto Pinochet comes to power, he's living in Chile, and it is said that he joins the intelligence services of Augusto Pinochet the Dino, the, the feared Dino, the intelligence service. And he gets involved, it is said, in interrogations and torture of political opponents of the Pinochet regime, including uh, a um, young Chilean writer who 15 years later writes an affidavit 
in which he alleges that he was tortured by Walter Hall. And that affidavit becomes part of the dossier that lands on my desk in October 1998, when Augusto Pinochet, getting medical treatment in London, is arrested, unbelievably, for crimes against humanity and genocide, the same subject that I wrote about in East West Street. And I become involved in that case. And so the next book will tell the story of Walter Hauf in Chile in parallel with the Pinochet case in London, when for the first time in human history, a former head of state was arrested, indicted, and subject to extradition proceedings to Spain for crimes committed long ago in a faraway place. Uh, and it connects, I suppose, in a sense, to the previous question. Um, to what extent the crimes of the past come home to roost? Uh, but we're back with crimes against humanity and genocide. Interestingly, I was instructed on the Pinochet case, or approach, on the very day of my grandfather's funeral, when I was in Paris. Uh, so there is a, a very curious point of connection between all of these stories. But the third and final part of the trilogy, which is what it will be, will be Pinochet in London and the story of Walter Hauf. Philippe, I, I, I wonder, I think we, we, we've talked about just that Nazi diaspora, the fact that it went beyond South America. <laughs> and I mean, I think we've been wondering whether there is any room for that aspect of the story you know, to slip in <laughs> to, to the, the, the third uh, sort of uh, volume. Yeah, no, I mean, I think that it will. You know, you and I have taught food. I can't remember if you were with me when um, that time when I was in Accra. I mean, these things are all connected. We could even, we've even found Ghanaian connections. You've sent me yeah. some amazing material. I was astonished by the material you sent me that I had never seen from Raphael Lemkin, the newspaper articles, where he yeah. responds to the allegation in 1951 that the treatment of black Americans is a genocide. And he says, no, it's not. And I really was deeply pained, I have to say. He's obviously putting a political agenda first. He needs the Americans aboard on his genocide project, and so he's going to react as he has. But what a painful read that was. But you remember Fui that moment. Everything is connected. When we were in Accra, and we went to see the then Attorney General, it was the first time I'd been to her office, Marietta Brew, and outside her office was a list of former Attorney Generals of Ghana. And on the list, I saw the name Jeffrey Bing. Okay, and I said, that's strange. There's a Jeffrey Bing in the book that I'm writing, East West Street, the point it hadn't been published. I, I, and you said, you said, you said to me, who is this Jeffrey Bing? You're Jeffrey Bing. And I said, well, he was a young barrister who in 1935 went to Berlin to a Congress presided by Hans Frank. And he wrote a letter which was published in a socialist magazine saying he'd just been to Berlin and this Congress of German law and there was this dreadful man, Hans Frank, who made an absolutely sort of fascistic, racist, anti-Semitic speech. And all the Germans got up and applauded and I was one of the group of, you know, 30 non-Germans. We sat on our seats and we would not applaud his speech. And it was the same Jeffrey Bing. The same yeah. Jeffrey Bing who became Attorney General of Ghana. Oh, yes. No, the Je Jeff Jeffrey Bing's family is, is, is known to a number of us, actually. And, and after, after I saw that piece in East West Street, I, I drew the attention of the son to, 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 to that. So, so yes, but no, so there, there is room very much for bits and pieces. I think you and I have also... Well, Schumann came, one of these Nazi doctors who became... Uh, he escaped to Ghana, became a doctor here. Because we have Hannah Rice, who was Hitler's personal lawyer, who opened a flying school here. So there, 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 there are quite a few interesting bits, and so we're, we're very much looking forward to, um, to you know. Well, the I mean, let's 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 think about that because my I will publish a small book, the one that I mentioned about colonialism and decolonization in in September 22, and I would love to find a way. Hopefully, COVID will be over by then, and it will tell the story of Madame Elisée and the Chagossians, but also the intellectual history, and it will be written in a literary style, I hope. Maybe Accra would be a great place in Africa to launch that book. Um, 
and we can imagine a visit in person rather than virtually. But I've got to thank you all because I've done so many events. I want to tell you, this is the best curated event I've ever done in four years on East West Street and on the Rat Line. The wonderful way in which you've organized the conversation is just brilliant. No surprise there, Fui. You're one of the best lawyers I've ever met. No surprise at all, you know, but wow, what a privilege to be in on this conversation. It's been a great privilege for, for us. And I think everybody here is excited. And thank you very much. I think we will, at least on this platform, give, give you <laughs> an applause. I'm sure the rest of the audience is, do, is doing that. But thank you. It's been really great. We've and and we stay in touch. And we raise a glass to Thomas Menson. Indeed, indeed. <laughs> Well, Oliver, I think we are we are out of time, but we. we oh, thank I you just so much. I just wanted to point out that Philip um, Thomas Menzies' daughter has left a comment for you in the chat. Appreciate oh my word! It. Yeah, Francis. Francis, Francis. I think it's the last comment. Um, as she yes. says, oh, yeah. Okay, have you seen it? Where is it? I'm just uh, sending a note. I'm just sending a note. Okay. <laughs> Oh, to the audience, um, she said, I wanted to thank Philip so much for dedicating his part of today's events to my father, Judge Thomas Mensa, and his very kind and heartful words about him, Francis. Yeah. That's so good to see you, Francis. I don't know if you're still on, but I send you heartfelt love and affection and wishes for your well-being in this very, very difficult time, and especially to your wonderful mother. I can't wait to hug her. I haven't seen her because we're not allowed to see each other, but I will be round the corner in Golders Green as soon as I can. I will be the first person there at your mother's doorstep bringing fruit and flowers and, and love and other things. Thank you. Thank you very much, Philippe. Thank you to uh, uh, Oliver Mark, who has organized this. Thank you to all the members of the panel who put in a lot of work. We've had a lot of passionate evenings of discussion. I think this has proved it all worthwhile. So thank you, everybody. Bye-bye.